What's up guys, Eric here, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about The Flash Season 8, Episode 9, otherwise titled Phantoms, so careful for spoilers if you're not caught up with The Flash this season. You've been warned, let's get into it. So before I start talking about the details of this episode, I had high hopes for this. I love this mystery, I love that The Flash tonally feels like The Flash to me. There's so many good things that are going on right now, which is why this episode was such a huge disappointment for me. I just was not vibing with this episode at all. And we're going to talk about that here. And I want to see what you guys think about it. So make sure you go down in the comments below and give me your thoughts on this episode, because I just didn't get it. I mean, it wasn't awful. It wasn't great. It just kind of felt like I, I kind of had the same feeling I had with the interlude episodes where I just didn't have a real feeling about it. And that's a problem. You want to feel something when you watch these episodes. All right. So first things first, let's talk about this. Stop saying leveled up. I will not. I just don't understand why the team behind the flash finds these words these phrases these things they say and they beat it into the ground the same thing with we are the flash stop saying leveled up we don't need to hear it every single episode we do not need to hear it and people don't even really talk like that i've never been with a friend and just used like the same catchphrase over and over and over again in just these weird unironic ways like when she's talking with sue she's like oh and leveled up and i'm like oh just can we, can we just stop? Like, I'm probably going to make this the thumbnail because I'm so frustrated with, with seeing and hearing leveled up. And I never thought I would be because I'm a gamer. I, I just, I'm over it. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about the Allegra and Chester stuff. Now, we've been saying for a long time that uh, this relationship for the most people feels very forced. And I think I figured out why it doesn't work for me. The, the main thing I think for a lot of people is there's not a lot of chemistry between Allegra and Chester. It just doesn't feel real. It feels completely manufactured and artificial. I don't know if that's the writing or maybe the two actors don't have chemistry together on screen. I don't know what it is. Something is not working between the two of them. And then as I was watching the episode, I'm like, I think the problem is there's nothing for me to believe that these two have even one solid thing in common that makes them a match. Now, you might say opposites attract, and that is true, but there's always something that you find in another person that you want to date or something that you admire in someone else that you're romantically interested in that connects you with that person. There has to be something. And for me, just working together in the same facility isn't enough to go, yeah, this, they work together. And also, this isn't a real relationship. It's one that we're watching on TV, which means you have to make us believe that these two characters belong together and they just don't it doesn't work i i don't know what the problem is other than that maybe there is something else that's going on in the back of my mind but i just feel like there's nothing the only thing i can theorize here is that they just don't have anything that connects them together and it feels very forced and the scene with allegra and chester the one scene they have together where she's kind of like giving them a pep talk which i hated because it felt like a pep talk scene Actually, it was, a, it was a pep talk scene, right? Uh, anyway, that scene, Allegra <laughs> felt like she was, you know, the, the acting in that scene felt like it was being dialed in. While Chester was giving 100%, it felt like she was giving like 40%. And I'm really sad because I like Chester, and I think this could have been a very strong episode for him because there is a lot of emotional stuff that happens towards the end. And they did such a sloppy job of sort of constructing it showing his visceral reaction to the photos and, you know, somehow roping it. So at the end, we find out that this creature, it feeds on grief. And so they're trying to rope that in throughout the episode with Chester. And I just don't think they did a great job with it. It felt way too obvious and forced, and there wasn't a lot of nuance with it. And it's not really what I come to expect from The Flash, honestly, in, in, in you know, regular graphic novels. It's just something didn't really gel with it. But Chester... I think Chester was strong in the episode with what he was given as a character. I, you know, there we go. All right, let's talk about Cecile. So I don't really have much to say about her in this episode because Cecile always overacts. And there was a couple scenes where she was overacting, especially in the end when the light was on her head. She was like, ah! And I'm like that they love to make her do that. They love to, like, they must love to see her, like, do this, like, emotional, like, ah! Because she does it all the time. Anyway, they made her do that, which was kind of cringy. They do that over the top all the time with her. But the one thing that bugged me was last week, the, the problem with trying to prove the innocence of Jocko was that she felt like it was an intrusion to read people that don't give consent to be read 
or something along with her work. Either way, it seems like she was going down this path that she's not going to just read people's emotions. Like she needs approval or it's a conflict of interest in what she believes morally with her job. But anyway, it seems like she was alluding to the fact that she wanted, she didn't want to use that as a way to prove someone's innocence or to determine if somebody's right or wrong or whatever. But then in this episode, she acts like she can't control feeling what somebody else is feeling. Either that or she does it without consent. One or the other. Because when you have um, Chester feeling anguish and grief, she starts to like act as if she can't stop not feeling it. Like it's something that she can't control. So my question is, can she control it and she just chooses when to turn it on and off? Or is it actually something that she has no control over, which means that she should technically, it should it should happen when she's around anybody with heightened emotions, especially Jocko, who is extremely upset about his kid and everything that was happening to him. If that wasn't enough to make her powers go off, then why was Chester's? It doesn't make sense. It's inconsistent writing and it's a continuity problem. And this is one of my biggest issues with Cecile as a character. And still to this day, she is a plot device in episodes. I wish she was more than that, but her powers don't allow her to be. It's a plot convenience power. And unfortunately, it, it just continues to prove to me that they don't know how to handle it or how to explain it or how to control it. It's just kind of there. All right. So Iris, this was one of the things I liked about the episode. We actually picked up at the beginning of this episode with Iris and Dion, which should have been the continuation from episode seven, two episodes ago, because this feels like a proper continuation of that story. There was a heated debate in the after party about this. Paige and I were on two opposite ends of, of thoughts on this. Um, I thought last week's episode, it was kind of weird that Iris didn't mention it, or we didn't get to see a moment where her eyes blinked green to remind us that she's still suffering from this. Uh, we skipped over that and then we went to this. So it felt like the stinger from episode seven should have been the stinger from last week's episode leading into this one. It definitely felt like this was the proper continuation, but anyway, so we have that going on and she is talking to Dion about the treatment she's having and explaining to him that she's, you know, feeling these jumps in time. And he tells her, well, I, like I told you this, we talked about this. I already knew, and it's not news to him, but he finds out that there is like a weird mutation with her time sickness where he's not sure what it is and he has to go research it. And so he goes away. And then the rest of the episode, we get to see Iris in coast city with Sue tracking down this coast city phantom character that um, we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but in, in that moment, she seems like she's upset or afraid about what's happening. And this is what I wanted from her last week. This is the proper continuation of that dialogue it, when you're telling a story, last week's episode was like a hiccup. It was like what was going on with, with CCC media was a hiccup, and this is the proper continuation. However, we find out at the end of the episode that there is something majorly wrong with Iris, but dun, 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 we're not going to find out in this episode. So there was a lot of wasted time with that. But at least we did continue the story, and I have to give him credit for that. And I'm very interested in what's going on with Iris you know, moving forward with the storyline. Now, Sue. Let's talk about Sue for a second. I like Sue as a character. She comes back in and she wants to go to Coast City with Iris and do this investigation. And I think Sue fits in perfectly on the show. She doesn't feel like she's out of place. But that has to do a lot with the fact that she's a guest character. She's not there every week. Maybe I would change my mind if she was there every week. But I don't mind seeing her. My issue is she is a direct line of communication to Ralph Dibney. And I'm sure there's still a ton of Ralph Dibney fans out there, Elongated Man fans, who would love to know what is happening with that character. And we know they're not bringing him back. Like, he's not coming back to the show. So why is it we can't come up with a final comment about him that sort of wraps up his entire character? Why couldn't she say, we broke up, he's moved on, I have no idea what he's doing, and leave it at that? And then he's just gone then we don't have to think about it anymore because now we're always wondering what's going on with Ralph. If Sue is just out doing stuff, he, it's not like he's not friends with people on team flash. The character didn't leave because of bad tweets. That was the actor. So he's still friends with team flash. So I don't really understand why we're ignoring him. I love Sue, but this needs to be addressed because I don't mind her coming back. I actually like her. So a little weird. All right, let's talk about Tenya Wazo, still one of the strangest names ever. 
Um, so a lot of people were trying to connect this to Legion of Superheroes because it is Phantom Girl. That's the character. I don't see any connection with Legion. I would be very surprised if they ever connect this character with anything related to that, because this seems to me like a character. She's got a very specific story with her mother on the flash and Iris has to, she talks her down with all the stuff she's doing. She's got phasing powers, sort of like Kitty pride. If you're familiar with that character, um, it doesn't seem to me like right now, especially with the way she was introduced and very lightly used in this episode that she has any connection to the Legion of superheroes. So I don't see that happening. I wouldn't jump to that conclusion. Let's hope we see her again. I don't mind the character. We didn't get very much with her, but it was a catalyst for Sue and Iris to pursue Iris's feelings about what's happening with her and talk her way through it by talking to Tenya. Um, not bad, just not great either. All right. So by the end of the episode, we find out because this black flame that they capture on one of the sites that they uh, find a burned up body, which by the way, Chester, again, MVP, came up with a way to track it through satellites, typical Star Lab stuff. But they find it and um, they bring it back to the lab and Chester starts at first hallucinating that the fire is getting out and then it actually does get out. So I don't really know what that was all about. But anyway, somehow <laughs> it doesn't get out for real the first time, but it does the second time when he's there with Allegro. And it starts attacking Star Labs, and everybody's sort of trying to do their best to, to fend this thing off, but they don't know how to stop it. And so they find out through Cecile's intrusion of emotion and Allegra just standing there yelling at Chester that this thing feeds on grief because Chester believes that it is his dead father who died in a similar accident coming back to make him feel bad about not being there for him. And so my question is, well, actually I have a couple questions. One is, if it's about grief, was it Barry grieving pretty hardcore in last week's episode while he was investigating this thing? And you might say, yeah, but, you know, he was there and then there were other people and it could have been anybody. Well, then why Chester? Why? And what is the significance of this little flame being there? Like, it's disconnected from the larger creature. Is it a person? Is it a being from outer space? I don't know, but either way it feeds on grief. And I'm like, so Barry was grieving last week because it was his father's birthday and his father died. So he's grieving and he wasn't targeted. However, it just so happens that when a fire meta was interacting with two people specifically, those two were the target of this grief creature, which Seems like a massive coincidence. And actually, when Joe tried to tie it up in this episode, I'm like, that doesn't really tie it up. That leads me to believe that the writers had no logical way to connect the hotness with those people in the bar. So they just said, oh, it's grief when anybody in the city could have been targeted. But for some reason, it was a fire effect, like a melting effect on people that were grieving who also interacted with a fire meta who was not related to this other fire meta completely in succession back to back. It was a very weird coincidence that to me doesn't add up. It is a weak story. I don't like it. I, I hate that that's the way they wrap that up because we're never going to find out anything else about it. That is just the way that's going to end. And Chester's grief apparently was more vulnerable than anybody else's, including Allegra's because she's lost people. Uh, Cecile's had a lot of stuff going on. Um, Barry, obviously. Uh, Frost. There, there's a lot of grief in Star Labs. So, Chester. Now, I know a lot of you are going to say, well, maybe he was the weaker one of all of them, but none of that was established in the episode. It was just that Chester had grief, and so it was going after him. I felt really bad about it. Did not like it at all. But I will say, I'm still enjoying watching Barry use his powers and his intelligence with other people to come up with solutions to problems that isn't just him running fast or combining with Iris and magically creating a solution. I love this aspect of the season. I think this is still very strong, and I still have hope for the storyline because I think the storyline could still be interesting. Um, I just feel like this episode was a missed opportunity. It wasn't as good as last week, and for me, it sort of feels around the same level as an interlude episode. Anytime I have an episode that I'm just kind of eh about, I'm going to say interlude episode because that's what it feels like to me. I know it's not, but that's what it is. There was a lot of really 
drawn out in between stuff, you know, from start to finish that I felt like could have been tightened up and we could have got a lot more content. I just, I, I didn't love it. I'm sorry. I didn't love it. And I would love to know what you guys think about it. So let me down in the comments below. With that being said, I'm going to give the episode a C, which I, several people argued with me about Superman and Lois in my C score. Um, a C for me is not bad. Like A is like mwah, mwah, perfection. B is like, they really did it. It was almost perfect. And C is just average. Like it was just good. It wasn't great. Wasn't awful. It was just okay. And for me, that's what the flash was this week. It was just okay. And, um, I don't know what else to add there. Uh, so what I want you guys to do is go down in the comments below let me know your thoughts and opinions on this episode of The Flash. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Did you feel like I felt about it? Was there any like little nitpicks that you have that I didn't cover? Anything that I talked about that you have an explanation for? Make sure you leave that down below. And do everything it says down here, scrolling on the bottom. Like, subscribe, comment, become a Team Eric member. Uh, we will see you on the after party on Saturday. I was about to say Friday. It's a wrong day. It's now Saturday. We'll see you at the after party on Saturday. We'll have a few special guests. We'll be talking about Superman, Lois, The Flash, and a lot of other fun topics. So stop in, and we will see everyone then. Take care.